strands of Christianity. Hello, welcome back to Straightforward, Levant TV's Middle East political debate show with me, Khal al Khawairi. The carnage in Gaza is ongoing. Some are celebrating it and calls for genocide have been have initiated. What did the world do and what did the Arab world do and who are the key regional and international players in preparation for the attack and throughout it? Swedish authorities refused to allow the plane of Israeli President Shimon Peres to cross into its airspace. And throughout the show, we will look at the humanitarian aspect of the crisis and then assess political dynamics and policy implications. Let me first welcome our guests here at the studio, Jim Brand of Stop the War Coalition and Sabah Jawad of Iraqi Democrats Against Occupation. Welcome on the show. Before we delve into our discussion today, let's have a look at this brief report by uh, Saima Jafar and Hassan Samak. As Israel intensified its operations in Gaza, hundreds of thousands of people around the world protested in support for the people of Gaza. Thousands took to the streets in London, New York, Paris, and even in Tel Aviv. London, Manchester, Liverpool, and Newcastle saw marches to protest at the BBC's biased reporting, as well as to gather signatures for an open letter to the BBC Director General. London took to the main stage of the protest movement. I urge all sides. United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki moon has urged Israel and the Palestinians to stop fighting and made an urgent appeal for maximum restraint. Meanwhile, U.S. President Barack Obama said although there is great concern for the increasing Palestinian civilian death toll, the U.S. supported Israel's mission. As I've said many times, Israel has a right to defend itself against rocket and tunnel attacks from Hamas. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, who is in Israel to conduct peace negotiations despite a Federal Aviation Administration ban on flying to the region, said slow progress was made on ceasefire talks. But will reactions and diplomacy help end what is happening on the ground? Jim Brand, since 2008, Israel had not had any ground invasion in Gaza. Before we get into the global reactions to this, how could we look at the significance of the timing and could we relate this to the recent event of forming a unity government with Hamas? I think undoubtedly, um, if you take the issue of the kidnapping of the three settler youth mm -hmm. and then the killing of the, um, the, the Palestinian boy, uh, for the Israeli government simply declared that the kidnapping was the work of Hamas. Even though, on the face of it, you would think, why on earth would Hamas specifically do that? It would be nonsense. Uh, so the intention of the Israeli government to uh, finger Hamas, to, to, to blame Hamas for things, is very, very clear. And I don't think there is any doubt that it has to do with the unity of the, mm -hmm. of the different factions in, in Palestine as a Why do you call them settler youth, not Israeli citizens? Well, the world, mm -hmm. the world recognizes a distinction. I mean, you have to be, you know, you have to be um, uh, cynical because there are protecting powers. Nevertheless, the world does not recognize uh, them as being Israeli citizens in that, in the same sense. Mm -hmm. Sabah Shawad, do you agree? Well, I think the distinction between uh, Israeli citizens and, uh, and uh, settlers is a very uh, uh, weak uh, distinction. Um, Israeli society is based, based on uh, settling in, in a land that does not belong to them. And therefore, the settlers, uh, and I think it's a, it's a fair description of them, uh, occupy the lands of Palestinians and uh, uh, promote uh, uh, discrimination against the Palestinians. And the Palestinians in, uh, have the right to mm -hmm. resist the, these people and to expel them from their land as, uh, as long as they are basically uh, tools and the occupiers and Sabah Jawad Hamas fired four rockets on Israel these were met by six Israeli airstrikes from a power perspective what can you tell us about the disproportionate aspect throughout this it's always been the case of disproportions uh, regarding the Palestinian struggle uh, to return to their homeland and the Israeli occupation uh, uh, of Palestine uh, the Israelis get all the uh, aid and uh, support from the most powerful nations on earth, the Western nations, uh, topped by the United States. Uh, they get the most advanced military uh, hardware, like Phantom F-16, uh, mm -hmm. tanks, and so on. And they got all the protection that's needed, actually. And the Palestinians have nothing. 
mm -hmm. uh, basically. They are rely on some kind of uh, rockets which they manufacture themselves or they got given by Syria yes. and uh, some other uh, regimes in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So it's always this approach. Uh, and, uh, and the Israelis always claim actually that their action is a response to these rocket attacks. Mm -hmm. But even the Palestinians don't fire rockets at, uh, at Israel, the, uh, the Israelis will find excuses to try to suppress the will of the Palestinian people. They've been at it for 65 years mm -hmm. and they will continue so until they break the back of the Palestinian resistance. Mm -hmm. Jim Brand at Jerusalem Post argues that no military operation could be more justified than Operation Protective Edge. What do you think of that? Well, I think first of all, as in all of human life, you have to distinguish between reasons and excuses. And to summarize it as briefly as possible, this is an, uh, an excuse. This is not a reason. This is assault on Gaza. Uh, the excuse is some, um, well, the, the, the rocket, the so-called so rockets, which somebody has called more like fireworks coming from Gaza, uh, the tunnels, uh, these are the two big excuses, but they're not the reason. The reason is is the the uh, injustice of the occupation of the suppression of the national rights of the Palestinians. That's the mm -hmm. that's the fundamental issue, and you can always find some justification or some excuse in the same way as uh, in in ordinary life. Like you can pick up on what somebody is looking at you wrongly or spilt something on you, and then use that as an excuse. It's mm -hmm. just an excuse. Mm -hmm. Sabah Jawad, speaking of the tunnels, from a security perspective, Jonathan Rosen questions what could have happened had Hamas used its tunnels into Israel before Operation Protect Protective Edge. Well, I mean, it seems, seems the tunnel uh, took Israel by surprise, and uh, at least uh, what the Israelis are saying, the press uh, and Israel are saying, is that the, the Netanyahu government uh, stood by not doing anything or did not know, uh, you know, the development of this uh, sinister. Uh, tunnels and and the occupied territories and particularly in Gaza, but everybody knows that the Palestinians be relying on these tunnels actually to break the sanction, mm -hmm. to break the uh, blockade uh, against uh, uh, against uh, Gaza. It's been uh, in place uh, uh, since 2008. Jim, um, here in the UK, we've seen protests starting in Glasgow in relation to what was considered nuanced media coverage. What do you think of the media starting here in the UK? Oh, I mean, we had this uh, very effective demonstration last Saturday, for example. Tell us more about that. Um, well, we say up to 100,000. I, I don't know how many it was, but it was a magnificent thing. It was seen in Palestine. There was a report on Channel 4 which said that it was received in Palestine with joyous disbelief. Mm -hmm. That was the effect in Palestine. It's very effective, very unified. Many organizations work together. It was very effective, uh, had a tremendous spirit. And I think the police said, well, we'll give them the whole street. I think they actually worked so out. So they the, cooperated, they worked hand in hand. The police, I can't really, I can't criticize the police with that. They gave us the full width of the street. Sometimes they say, well, you can have half the width of the street. They just said, have it. And I think it was probably in their interest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, the question of BBC bias. So I uh, went to look online at the reports of the demonstration on Sunday. And there were some very good ones. There was one, there's a newspaper that's not particularly sympathetic. Their website's the Daily Mail. The website, the Daily Mail online website, had a headline, uh, in our thousands, in our millions, we are all Palestinians, which is a slogan that people were chanting. So on that the was on the Daily Mail? That was on the Daily Mail website Quite on Sunday. Eyebrow raising, isn't and it? And they had a very good, very uh, respectful picture of the full width of the demonstration. So I then went to look at the BBC's coverage on BBC online. Mm -hmm. And I must. I was. I was disgusted. I'm. I'm used to things, and I was just disgusted because they had, I think, about eight items relating to Palestine, and the main one to do with protest was riots in Paris, not in and, London even. And there was no mention. And when you read to the end of the French article, you saw a reference to the London demonstration. And then they had links on the BBC website to, for example, the Times of India, reporting on the London demonstration. <laughs> 
but mm. no BBC report on the London mm. demonstration. Yeah. Quite extraordinary. Yeah, I just say that the BBC is well known for its uh, bad coverages and biased coverages against the Palestinians and the Arab, uh, Arab causes. They've done the same to Lebanon, uh, resistance against the Israeli invasion of Lebanon and the resistance against the Israelis in, in other parts of the world mm -hmm. and their coverage of Syria as well. The BBC reflect uh, the views of the government uh, of the British government and the British government views about what's happening in the Middle East is very much tied up with the uh, with the state of Israel and the support of the Israeli action no matter what's happened and we've just seen the statement by the new foreign secretary uh, visiting Netanyahu he blamed the Palestinians basically for uh, starting this uh, mm -hmm. uh, genocide which is taking place against them. But meanwhile let me interrupt David Ward Lib Dem MP got suspended for not apologizing straight away or for even stating what he said about absolutely i mean this is the this is a case and bbc is, is well known in britain at least among the activists in, in britain who support the palestinians support the arab uh, struggle for independence and for liberations uh, they call the bbc the second israeli embassy in london and this is truly the case because they tried uh, uh, all their efforts uh, to prevent uh, the british public who pays the license fee for the BBC from hearing the truth about what's happening in Palestine. But despite that fact, uh, hundreds of thousands of people took to the street, uh, not only last Saturday, uh, so almost on a daily basis there is a demonstration outside the Israeli embassy and pickets. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to be one tomorrow and one Saturday. And there's going to be uh, you know, more demonstrations taking place in all major cities in the UK. Let me just clarify these other views of our guests, of course, be it about the BBC or any other subjects, and we do respect them. And uh, speaking of David uh, Ward, what do you think of suspend, his suspension, basically, for what he said? Well, it's interesting that um, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Prime Minister is Cameron, um, and uh, Cameron and his party are very openly um, supportive of Israel. But the deputy prime minister is from the Liberal Democrat Party. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, and I can think of different reasons, nevertheless, about a week ago, um, the deputy prime minister, Nick Clegg, leader of the Liberal Democrat Party, very pointedly said that the Israeli uh, bombing was uh, deliberately disproportionate. Mm -hmm. So there is this clear faction within the Liberal Democrat Party which is far more in tune with public opinion, and which the Deputy Prime Minister, in the conditions of a forthcoming general election, feels it is important for him to somehow express. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that's positive, I would say. Sabah so, Shawad, very briefly, how important and how effective are these demonstrations? Tell us about it from the perspective of an organization like Iraqi Democrats Against Occupation. I, th I think it's very, very important, uh, actually. Sometimes you don't see the fruit of your action uh, mm -hmm. immediately, but we know from the Iraqi experience, there's a massive demonstrations that took place in, in London. In fact, the biggest demonstration ever took, uh, took place in London was uh, in support of Iraq against uh, uh, military attack and against occupation. Over two million people participated in, the, in that demo. Mm -hmm. And the result of that demonstration was not immediately visible because the occupation of Iraq happened and the war against Iraq happened as well with the participation of the British government. But we saw the result of such campaign actually in regard to the Syrian crisis. Mm -hmm. when, the, when Parliament was debating whether to intervene military uh, in Syria, the, even Parliament voted against it. True. True. And now we are joined by uh, political activist Tamara Barakat. Welcome on Straight Forward. Uh, thank you so much. Tamara, what do you think of media coverage on Gaza, starting from the UK, and please touch on the West as well, America? Um, as I said before, the media coverage, especially in the West, is totally biased, and it only gives uh, the Israelis to tell their side of the story, and it makes it sound as if, uh, not recently actually, but for, for a while, the civilized democratic Israel versus the savage terrorist Palestine. This has been the image that has been portrayed in the media for ages. And uh, whatever contradicts this image is totally ignored by the media. Um, as your guest mentioned, uh, many protests took place uh, around the world and in huge numbers to support the Palestinians. 
and yet uh, the mainstream media, not just um, in the UK but in the US and other uh, countries, Western countries, they ignore that on purpose. Yes, and Tamara, they Tamara were, what yeah. in your opinion could, could make a difference given, as you argue, mainstream media has been biased, but what could make a difference here? Is it social media? Is it activism? Social media, that is why um, if, if you uh, follow Twitter and Facebook, you, you, you could see people referring to uh, social media to show uh, what the other side of the story, to show the protest, people that are, who are in the social media uh, yes. pro, uh, image, sorry, that has been portrayed of the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. So um, that's... that's now social media is gain, gaining momentum in uh, mm. uh, Tamara, in its reaction, Saudi Arabia seemed to be supportive and condemned the attack on Gaza. Yet there are people who think the kingdom was connected somehow in orchestrating the attack. What do you think? And they and behind closed doors and that the We'll come back to you a little bit, uh, okay. a little bit later, Tamara. We have a bad line. We will get back to you shortly. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, Jim Brown, what do you think of the Saudi role? If, if do you, you believe there was a role in orchestrating the attack, be it indirectly or directly? There is no doubt, uh, and and it was spoken about quite openly last year that there was a developing axis between Israel and Saudi Arabia. These things are usually choreographed in such a way that it's not done by a formal agreement or something, but if you look at the, the um, stands of the different parties, you can see a coordination. And I think it's extremely likely that there was some kind of understanding there, yes. Can I, can yes. I, add, uh, I think uh, it's correct to, to what's been said, uh, the role of Saudi is quite visible. Uh, and a, and a couple of points, actually. One of them is that uh, we've seen in the past few years in the so-called Arab Springs, a co coordinated efforts to uh, destabilize the resistance bloc, if you like, um, in Lebanon, in Syria, uh, in Iraq, and against Iran. Um, somebody is trying very hard, and I think it's led by the Saudis uh, and, the, uh, and the Turkish, uh, Turkish government, uh, with the backing of America uh, to destabilize the areas and create some kind of like a, a united front against uh, Iran and the resistance movement uh, in the Arab world. We've seen what's happened in Syria, we've seen the pl plots against uh, Lebanon and demonization of Iran as well as mm -hmm. part of the campaign to uh, put Israel in a very favorable light. Why, and why are they interested in demonizing Iran? Well, they quite obviously the uh, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf uh, Cooperation Councils, the regimes there, which has nothing to do with democracy. They are our antiquated entities uh, in the Arab in the, in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. They could not survive without uh, giving services to the United States and Israel, and they've been doing that. Qatar, for example, was leading the uh, the campaign to destabilize. Uh, many countries in the Middle East, like Syria and Lebanon and Iraq mm -hmm. and so on. And so, so they think that by uh, playing a role in attacking the resistance in the Arab world and aligning themselves with the Israelis and more with the Americans, mm -hmm. they will be able to safeguard their uh, interest uh, in the future. So back to Tamara. Tamara, uh, it, in its reaction, Saudi Arabia seemed to be supportive and at the same time condemned the attack on Gaza. Uh, what do you think of the Saudi role in uh, previous, prior to the attack? Saudi Arabia is an ally of the U.S. and uh, this um, makes it worse to uh, do what the U.S. tells it to do. So that is why you see um, on the outside that they, they show compassion and they say we condemn the attack and we, we are looking for uh, to, to uh, implement ceasefire. But uh, behind closed doors, they they finance and they support the attack due to many reasons. First, Hamas is uh, now Qatar's ally, 
Mm-hmm. And as you know, uh, Qatar and Saudi Arabia are arch enemies. And not to mention Hamas strong relations with Muslim Brotherhood, which is also uh, an arch enemy of the uh, of Saudi Arabia. So the thing is, uh, it, it, it's pretty complicated, yet it's pretty simple at the same time. Uh, if you're an ally uh, of the U.S., you have to uh, to, uh, to adopt uh, the U.S. doctrine in the region. You have to de- demonize, like your uh, guest said, demonize Iran to adopt sectarian speech. To make Iran uh, the 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 biggest danger, we have to um, to get rid of, and to make Israel uh, the less danger or something we should. Uh, yes, Tamara, Tamara, to Sabah, Israel. Sabah, Jawad would like to add on that. Stay with us. Well, I think the the points about uh, the Saudi role uh, and all this is uh, it might might also be linked to. Um, the positions of the Saudi regime to Hamas. Hamas is well known as part of the International Muslim Brotherhood organizations, and they've been getting a lot of support from Al-Qatari and Doha uh, governments. And the Saudis don't like that, actually. They wanted to kind of like a competition, Saudi Arabia in uh, in competition with Qatar regarding uh, their allies in the area. And I think it's, uh, you know, the Saudis, first of all, wanted to weaken the resistance movement in the Arab world, but in the, in the same time, they also want to weaken the advantages uh, Qatar gained uh, by establishing a strong link with the Muslim Brotherhood uh, internationally. And we see the positions, for example, regarding the, that's manifested itself in uh, positions regarding the Egyptian regime. Mm-hmm. You know, after getting rid of uh, Mercy government, uh, the Saudi have the upper hand in relationship with the with the Egyptian uh, regime as well. Tamara, very briefly, do you agree? I totally agree, and also uh, uh, to add more, it shows the contradiction of the uh, Saudi logic, you can say, because they have been. Uh, I mean, Saudi, Saudi uh, politicians have been um, uh, have been adopting a sectarian speech for ages. They 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 have been targeting Hezbollah and Iran uh, because they are Shia. Yet they also target Hamas, which is Sunni uh, organization. If you wanna, you know, uh, call it like this. So the thing is, um, those who follow uh, Saudi Arabia or believe what Saudi Arabia does or says, they have to 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 do reality check and just see uh, the situation in Gaza. And it, it's a perfect example just to show that any sectarian speech has nothing to do with politics, no matter how much uh, uh, Saudi uh, affiliated uh, clerks try to portray it as mm-hmm. Sunni versus Shia. Mm-hmm. Actually, it's uh, political interests yes. versus other political interests. Mm-hmm. Tamara Barakat, London-based political activist, thank you very much for being on the show at very short notice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. Yeah. In Israel, Knesset member Ayelet Shaked called for the killing of the mothers of Gaza children who were targeted by Israeli strikes. She argues they need to be killed for delivering the innocent children she called, quote, little snakes. The world described the killing of children as appalling. In Lebanon, all eight prominent TV stations presented an unprecedented unified news bulletin in solidarity with the children, women and foreign activists in Gaza. Before we talk about the humanitarian element in the conflict, let's have a look at this brief report on child victims and the psychological consequences that the attack survivors will have to bear. Since Israel began its Operation Protective Edge on Gaza, currently more than 600 Palestinians have been killed. More than 500 of these are civilians and according to UNICEF, a third are children. The UN says more children than Palestinian fighters have been killed in the offensive. UK newspaper Telegraph reported that the Al Mizan Center for Human Rights, a Gaza based human rights organization which works with the UN, has verified the deaths of 132 children between July 7th and July 21st. So far, no Israeli children have been killed in the conflict, but Israeli activists and researchers report that the conflict has traumatized children on both sides of the walls. Trauma counselors say the constant fear of airstrikes and rocket fire has led many children of Gaza to suffer deep depression and anxiety. 
أنتم ومن وراءكم من دول القرار نحن شعب لم يعد يخيفه الدمار فالموت في حياتنا قصد من النهار Jim Brand, more than 130 children have been killed in Gaza, and the numbers are rising. Could we explain targeting these children through, the, through looking into Zionist ideology that believes in addressing the source of what they consider the problem? Absolutely. Uh, you cannot believe, in my opinion, you cannot take the Israeli explanation to be anything but an excuse. And then you look at the facts and you arrive at a conclusion based on those facts. If you persistently kill uh, hundreds of people, uh, we are now on course to have a repetition of 2009. In 2009, the, all the line about we take great care, you know, this is the endless repeated Israeli line, we take great care, we, 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 we more than anybody else we take great care. They managed to kill in 2009 one Gazan in 1,000. One Gazan in every thousand was killed in 2009 which they considered to be great care, great restraint. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in four weeks they did that in 2009. In six years of the Second World War, the German bombing managed to kill one Briton in every thousand. In six years. So that gives you some idea when they talk about taking great care, etc. I think Are we, we comparing here when you mention Germany in the Second World War? Uh, there's a valid comparison, I mean, you have to be... It, it, it just gives you some mm -hmm. idea of the scale. If they talk about, mm -hmm. you know, the mm -hmm. restraint that we, we, we exercise, then in that sense it's worth pointing out that in, in six years of Second World War, the same proportion of the British population was killed as in Gaza. In the sa so therefore I think that the killing of children effectively is part of the exercise. I refer anybody to the fact that 44 years ago the... Israeli Prime Minister came to London twice and said, the Palestinians do not exist. That was a mm -hmm. notorious expression of the time. The and it looked like, 44 years ago, you could say the Palestinians do not exist. 11 years ago, the head of the Israeli military said, the Palestinians must come to know in their deepest consciousness that they are a defeated people. Mm -hmm. Which, apart from anything else, so is a change. If you do not exist, you cannot have a deepest consciousness. So actually the situation was moving in that sense against Israel. Mm -hmm. This idea that you must teach the Palestinians a lesson, which is what he said 11 years ago, I think that is the constant Zionist line. Mm -hmm. If we cannot eliminate the Palestinians, then at least we m must teach them that, uh, that they are a defeated people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's basically what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Sabah, I saw you taking some notes there. Y yes, I mean, uh, it's very obvious actually that the founding uh, fathers of the State of Israel, um, uh, they considered that actually after a while, after uh, 10, 15 years, 20 years, the Palestinians will forget about Palestine, a new generation will come. And they're, not, they're not giving them the chance to forget. Really. Yeah, well, that, precisely this is the, what they thought they could, they could achieve in Palestine, for the Palestinians to forget uh, the land of uh, Palestine because the new generations are born and, uh, and you know, the old generation dies. True. But we've seen, uh, in fact, on the contrary, the new generations in Palestine are uh, more uh, demanding than their fathers mm -hmm. uh, regard, uh, regard their rights to return back to, uh, to, to, to Palestine. And at the same time, the Palestinian perceive the, the Palestinian children as uh, a project for a future struggle, and therefore they want to attack it and under, undermine it. And there are also links, for example, uh, uh, between this action against the children and the, uh, and the action against olive trees in Palestine. And uh, when the Israeli police and army attack uh, Palestinian youth, they seem to hit them. They, uh, I've been told by Palestinians, actually, uh, involved in the Antipada, previous Antipadas in Palestine, that the Israeli police hit them in the groin because that area represents kind of like continuity for the future. And new children will come about and uh, uh, carry the flag for the liberation of Palestine. So this is part and parcel of the ideology of denying the Palestinians their right to struggle uh, uh, in Palestine. Mm -hmm. And killing the children is uh, one obvious way of doing it. 
and Jim Brown, uh, the UN says more children than Palestinian fighters are being killed in the offensive. Do you think there could be a way to, uh, to evacuate, for example, women and children by the help of the West to, to bring them to a safe haven? It's possible. I think you have to be very careful because, um, uh, for example, <laughs> since the Israeli des fundamental desire is to eliminate the Palestinians as Palestinians, for example, uh, Gaza has been under complete Israeli blockade since whatever it is, 2008. Y you have to be careful because if you let out a whole section of the Gazan population, I don't think Israel is going to let them back in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. you, you have to think these things through. And, and speaking of women and children, Navi Pillay, United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, said there seems to be a, quote, a strong possibility that, the inter that international humanitarian law has been violated in Gaza. Do you agree? And if so, why are top figures still portraying the issue in shades of grey? Absolutely, I agree, and I think that Navi Pillay's uh, words are very diplomatically chosen, and uh, I understand why. But why? I don't, because uh, she occupies that special position, where apart from anything else, as an international civil servant, all international civil servants are in that position, where they are under great pressure from the from the big powers and the big donors and so on. Uh, I think it's undoubted. You see, it was established by the Geneva Conventions of 1949 the imperative to distinguish uh, between civilians and, and, and fighters. And just self-evidently on the face of it, see the overwhelming majority of Israelis who have been killed are soldiers who are, were actually in Gaza. They were engaged in land operations. If you take away the Israeli soldiers that were killed, then the disproportion is enormous. And I simply suggest that the enormous disproportion is a deliberate policy. I don't think there's any other explanation. Do you agree? Uh, yeah, I, uh, but at the same time, I mean, you know, just uh, I think uh, the United Nations Human Rights uh, Commission voted uh, yesterday uh, to hold an investigation into human rights violations of the bombing in Gaza. Uh, the European countries, by the way, they abstain, uh, mm. and this is to the eternal shame of the European countries who are supposed to be championing human rights and not only. Uh, uh, in the Middle East, but uh, across the, wo the world, they had to abstain uh, they, uh, from, from this uh, uh, investigations. But uh, a lot of people in the Middle East, and I'm one, I'm one of them, uh, consider uh, the United Nations and institu institutions belonging to that organization becoming part and parcel of the U.S. Uh, uh, State Department. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen a human rights uh, organization in the world switching uh, uh, to become uh, part of the U.S. policies, and there is no surprise actually that the United Nations will conduct an investigations, but will no, will do nothing about the result mm -hmm. of such an, uh, investigations, mm -hmm. uh, because Israel could get away with murders, mm -hmm. and Israel could get away with murder precisely because America and uh, Western powers are supporting it to the health. Mm -hmm. And now we are joined by Mohammed Ali, Palestinian political activist. Welcome on Straightforward. Hello to you and welcome to your guest. Mohammed, who in your opinion decided to stop this war in Gaza? To start uh, this war in Gaza, sorry. Um, so far, no breakthrough in diplomatic efforts. Hamas points to view uh, that no cease uh, fire without agreement to lift the blockade in Gaza. Also, the Israelis say they might withdraw from Gaza without agreement. Chiefing, nothing, just killing over 700 civilians and 4,000 wounded. The U.S. and Egypt has no influence on Hamas, so they try with Turkey and Qatar to organize ceasefire. Yes. Uh, I think there will be no ceasefire without meeting uh, the Hamas uh, condition. Yes, and what do you think of the targeting of hospitals in Gaza? And do you think Israel is aiming at imposing a blockade for long? I think it's barbaric action by the Israeli target uh, hospitals in Gaza. Israeli occupation cowardly targeted ambulances and hospitals. Has targeted uh, Shahada Al-Aqsa Hospital and also has targeted Al-Wafa Hospital. There is no evidence of what so over 
Israeli occupation claim that Hamas rocket uh, launcher uh, site and placed beside the hospital. And now targeted UNRWA, uh, UNRWA school and they killing more than 16 civilian children and women. Yes. But uh, mm -hmm. the Israeli have no mercy. If they can, they will impose it forever. Mm -hmm. But I appeal to the Egyptian government must uh, open the Rafah crossing and allow release and medical convoy yes. to enter Gaza. And also allow the wounded people to be treated in Egypt. Mm. Mohammed, we have seen uh, support in the Arab world from the media. Uh, what about action by major players in the Arab world at the diplomatic level? Sadly and unfortunately, uh, the Arab government uh, turning a blind eye on what's happening in Gaza. If some of the Arab government against Hamas, it means they are against over two million people of Gaza Strip because, because Hamas is democratically elected government. Yes. That was Muhammad Ali joined us over the phone. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you. With boots on the ground, Operation Protective Edge is the first, but not necessarily the last, phase of Israeli ground operations. Prime Minister Netanyahu and his Defense Minister Moshe Yalon have ordered the IDF to prepare for a major expansion of the ground operation. Before we get into uh, talks about the key players in all this and possible avenues to conflict resolution, let's have a look at this brief military chronology by Saima Jafar. Over the past two weeks, around 140 militants have been killed in Gaza, amounting to around 20 to 25 percent of the total Palestinian death toll. According to military analyst Alex Fishman, about 3,000 tons of explosives have been dropped on Gaza in the first 15 days of the conflict, with more than 2,100 rockets being fired from Gaza, targeting cities in Israel that hadn't previously been targeted, including Tel Aviv, Haifa and Israel's nuclear base Dimona. The initial cause in 2006-2012 and now in 2014 has been a new attempt by Hamas to change the strategic facts on the ground increasingly relying on rockets and missiles rather than irregular warfare in the form of ground or naval attacks on Israel. Hamas's rocket fire has caused fear and panic among Israelis in south and central Israel, with sirens sounding many times a day warning people to seek shelter. A big achievement from Hamas's perspective has been the disruption of flights to and from Tel Aviv's airport, with airlines from the US, Europe and elsewhere suspending flights after a rocket hit a house near the airport. Last week saw Israel intensify its offensive as it moved its troops on the ground for a ground invasion. By Wednesday morning, Hamas had killed 29 IDF soldiers and said it had also abducted a soldier. But the question is, have the changes in tactics and technology achieved anything different to previous conflicts? Sabah Jawad, uh, Israel accepted Egyptian proposed ceasefire. Hamas rejected it. It fires rockets into Dimona and Haifa and even Tel Aviv. It's easy to say the war is disproportionate, but the people of Palestine say they are entangled in a war that they know they're not winning. What are your thoughts on Hamas's decision to carry on? I think uh, Hamas's decision to carry on and not to give up uh, its weapons uh, is part, of, uh, part and parcel of the demand by the people of Palestine, not only in Gaza, but also in other occupied uh, Palestinian lands and um, the whole masses in the Middle East, actually, the people in the Middle East and uh, the freedom-loving people across the world. Why should the Palestinians actually not struggle or lay down their arms when they are subjected to this kind of treatment for the past 65 years and the lands have been taken away from them? Is their rights and legitimate rights to struggle and to use all means possible, actually, to? Uh, to, uh, to go back to their uh, homeland. Uh, Israelis is very limited in what they, they could do, actually. We've seen the past 16th day, their limitation exposed, as their limitation exposed in Lebanon mm -hmm. in, 2000, uh, in the year 2000 and 2006, mm -hmm. where the Palestinian resistance scored notable, uh, the Lebanese resistance scored notable victories against them. And uh, we've seen the same situation developing in 
Palestine. Uh, Hamas and other organizations, let's not forget, is uh, Islamic Jihad is also involved, and other resistance movement uh, mm -hmm. uh, in Palestine. They're all united, and they are showing a new type of confidence. They are, uh, I believe, most of the rockets you've seen uh, fired at, uh, in, uh, in Israel, at Israel now um, is manufactured in Gaza, actually, by the Palestinians themselves. So they're acquiring new technologies. And this kind of things actually was inevitable to happen mm -hmm. because Israel for the past 65 years has superiority yes. in the air. Their phantoms and so on could destroy a lot of, a lot of uh, oppositions to it. Mm -hmm. But now with the, with the development and the advanced technology, especially in rocket making, could endanger yes. Israeli cities and in the uh, Israeli airport. Now we've mm -hmm. seen many American airlines are stopping their people flying to, uh, to Ben-Gurion Ben airport uh, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, Israel has a limitation what they can do in Gaza. And by the way, up until now, today is the 17th day of uh, the war starting. Um, they haven't even entered Gaza proper. They are on outskirts of Gaza. Mm -hmm. If they go to Gaza deeper into Gaza, you will see the Israeli casualty will multiply uh, instead of the 30 or so Israeli soldiers you probably see in their hundreds mm -hmm. uh, die. And Israel cannot afford uh, for such a result to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jim Brown, French Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius said uh, France will act forcefully to demand an immediate ceasefire. Tell us more about your activism in the UK to push the Palestine agenda into Westminster. Well, uh, clearly, I mean, there's been demonstrations during the week over the last couple of weeks, but clearly last Saturday was the, the, the focus, and that was the first clear national demonstration. Uh, there's another one this Saturday and uh, there's every reason to think that it will be that much more impressive than last Saturday. Uh, if you go back to 2009, just to show um, in the assault, the Israeli assault of 2009, there was a demonstration every weekend, a national demonstration every weekend on the question of Palestine through the four weeks of the Israeli assault. Mm -hmm. So uh, when uh, uh, in two, 2010, an Israeli institute called the Reut Institute was asked to summarize the Israeli lessons from the assault of 2009. They came up with the statement that um, Israel had won the ground war, which is a kind of odd thing to say since it was more like a massacre than a war, but they said we lost the propaganda war. And they said the propaganda war is being fought in, especially they said in London, in New York and Montreal. Uh, they know that they are liable to get the same thing, a continuous series of national demonstrations this time because they got it last time. So I think there's a large element of bluff on Israel's part because in 2009 they had to slip the whole assault in between the election of Obama and the inauguration of Obama. So they had that constraint. Now they claim they're unconstrained. They say there is no limit. But they are aware of 2009. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very, uh, that, you know, that's a good context to look at the thing in because if it's happened before, if we made it happen before, we will make it happen again. Mm -hmm. Mideast editor David Hurst argues in the Huffington Post the attack on Gaza comes by Saudi royal appointment and he said the Mossad and Saudi intelligence officials meet regularly. Sabah Jawad uh, uh, can you comment on that and tell us briefly what you think of the Saudi role in all this, be it before the attack or throughout it? Well, the role of Bandar uh, bin Sultan is a uh, very obvious one. Uh, everywhere he focus on, uh, you see that place is uh, up in flames and uh, destruction prevail. Can you give us an example? For example, Syria. And um, since uh, he was uh, responsible for what's the event and supporting uh, uh, terrorist uh, initially. groups initially and uh, until he was ousted. It seems that uh, when they fail to do their their task uh, designated to them by the American, they normally sacked. And this was happened to Bandar mm -hmm. uh, bin Sultan. And before him, the rulers of Qatar were also uh, the prime minister and the uh, emir of Qatar was uh, disbanded to London. Mm -hmm. And uh, his the Emir's son was appointed as the ruler of... Uh, Sheikh Tamim, yes. Sheikh Tamim was appointed the ruler of 
Qatar. So this is, it seems that there is a, a link, a very strong link with the Saudi royal family with all these takfiri forces and terrorist forces emerging very powerful in a pow very powerful wa uh, way in Lebanon and Syria and Yemen mm -hmm. and in Iraq. Uh, we've seen how these terrorist groups initially was uh, created by the CIA mm -hmm. and the Saudi ro royal family in Afghanistan and the Arab fighters and so on because they are politically and military trained by the Saudi and financed by the Saudi with the blessing of America to be used and utilize uh, to fragment the Middle East and create chaos in the Middle East. Yeah. So it's easy for the American to control that vital part of the Middle East as a, a resource for energy resource uh, in the area as well. And to use, use the situation, their control of the Middle East uh, to fend off competition from uh, new emerging powers in the world, mm -hmm. like China, like uh, Russia, like India, mm -hmm. and so on in the future. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said the IDF is progressing on the ground according to plan. The achievements on the battlefield are clear and that he is impressed with the operations to destroy the tunnels, adding it was beyond expectation. Jim Brown, uh, tell us, uh, it's clear that the tunnels are a major element in Israel's security. Do you think now that this has been achieved, the crackdown on the tunnels, Israel will be more open to discuss a resolution and a ceasefire or do you think it has to wait until Hamas has no more influence in Palestine and not, no longer a part of the unity government until it can uh, get into a conflict resolution? I think that this line again of saying looking at reasons and looking at excuses is very important. Because if you remember that originally the Israeli rationale was the rockets, even though um, Somebody described the rockets, the, 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 the Gazan rockets, as more like sophisticated fireworks, mm -hmm. whereas we know that Israeli weaponry is extremely sophisticated. So even there, there's no, the two words are not describing the same thing. But then suddenly, Netanyahu raised the question of the tunnels. And you have to ask yourself, we know that there have been tunnels, and I'm talking about between Gaza and Israel, although we know that Israel maintains this free fire zone between um, the borders of Gaza and, and, and uh, Israel. And um, it has all the technology to de detect tunnels. We know that there was this Israeli soldier, if you remember, Gilad Shalit, who was captured and held for five years and so on. And um, uh, if there is this massive network of tunnels, either it's not being used, because you can hardly name an incident as a cause by uh, Palestinians coming across the tunnels, or again, you have to ask, is this just another excuse? Mm -hmm. And I suggest that it's just as liable to be a phantom, to be an excuse. It may help in the sense that if Netanyahu claims the tunnels were a problem, he can then declare that the tunnels are no longer a problem because it's entirely up to him. It's not subject to rational proof. But apart from that, I would say there's a couple of things worth pointing out. There is a large element of bluff in the Israeli position because uh, I do not think that they planned on, uh, they thought that they would deal with the softening up of Gaza and then they would go in with the mm. military. Mm. I do not think they expected 30 Israelis dead. I just, mm. It doesn't make sense. And an example of that is a, a, a man in the um, uh, United States in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology who says, incidentally, this Iron Dome system, you know, the Israelis mm. claim to have this brilliant system for shooting mm. down these... Uh, rockets. What did he say about that? He said that it's bluff. And I just note, because the Israelis say... No, that it was from MIT. It, this man from, from MIT, he produced a report that, I think it came out yesterday because I read it today. Yes. He said that whereas the Israelis say that they shoot down 90%, that's what they claim, 90% of the projectiles coming from Gaza, he reckons they shoot down 5%. Mm -hmm. And he gives reasons. And I, I think so there's this large element of bluff and you always have to look for the bluff, the element of excuse in what the Israelis say. And now we are joined by Palestinian journalist Sameh Habib. Welcome on Straightforward. Oh, thank you. Sameh, what does it mean to you that Israel has its boots on the ground now? Well, you know, Israel is trying, I think, to achieve any victory. They've been... Um, there for nearly 18 uh, days now, and they haven't achieved anything solid for them, really. 
and Netanyahu government is trying to tell the uh, national front that, uh, look, we are achieving success in the ground. We're uh, attacking the tunnels that Hamas is using. We are um, ending the capacities of Hamas, although on the ground the Israelis have not succeeded, really. Like, um, what they've done so far is attacking some areas in the outer skirts of the Gaza city, and they have not really achieved anything in terms of the uh, um, destroying the uh, infrastructure of the Palestinian resistance, and I think it's going to be a very hard job to do. And I think because of uh, the uh, ceasefire talks taking a place in uh, in Ramallah, Tel Aviv, and, um, and and Cairo. So it's I think Israel is trying to to put sort of pressure on the uh, parties making these negotiations in order to achieve as much as possible. And Israel is, have been escalating uh, uh, their attacks since yesterday after the speech of Khaled Mishal, where they knew that Hamas is not going to make any concessions. And the way to, uh, in their view, to make Hamas making any concessions is just to yes. put more pressure and to get more victims and casualties in the Palestinian side. So the, hopefully the people in Gaza, according to the Israelis, would rebel and do something against Hamas, which is not mm. the case and would not happen. Samah, uh, Samah, what do you think uh, of the UN stance when it comes to assessing the violation of uh, humanitarian law? So you mean, uh, I didn't get you, international law you asked me about? Uh, the international humanitarian law, the UN did mention that there is a possibility that it could have been violated in Gaza. But they weren't really very blunt about it. They did. They, they said it was just a possibility. What do you comment on that? Okay, it's not a possibility. You know, Israel has a black history of uh, violating international law, committing war crimes, either starting in 1948 or in Lebanon later on or in other Arab countries. Israelis have been committing heinous massacres against the Arabs, and the international community has been cherishing and. Uh, protecting Israel and is the Israeli leaders, and uh, we cannot really forget what happened in Lebanon and Kana when the Israelis have attacked the UN uh, shelter twice in 1996, and I think in. It, it, but in, but in, let me in, stop you there, uh, uh, Sameh. Sameh, speaking of Kana and massacres, do you believe there's a threshold basically before the international community can take a very firm a stance towards Israel? Well, I think if we if we manage to get or mount more popular uh, pressure and we get more politicians and, and, and the media here yeah, to stand with us, and which is the case now, we're getting more people, more organizations uh, joining us as Palestinians here because what the, what Israel is doing is, is something that those people cannot really stand. Even I know that Barry Gardner, who was a uh, member of parliament for Brent now, he was very supportive of Israel, but he was very critical, and he described the Israeli attacks on Gaza or like a week ago as barbarism, you know, and this is the first time. So we got people changing their views because they cannot really agree on the grim Israeli attacks on the civilians in Gaza. So I, I don't know what is it that the international community is waiting. Are they waiting the, the Israelis to use their nuclear weapons in Iran or in Gaza, or what is it that they're waiting the Israelis? I think the international community is complicit I think it's not only Israelis that is uh, that, that are uh, waging this war in Gaza. It's the international mm -hmm. community. Uh, yes. uh, uh, Europe, I think, gave the green light for the Israelis to uh, make this full-scale attack. The Arab countries as well they have given the Israelis the green light. And I think uh, I expect there would be more civilian casualties. As you know, today by itself, more 100 and nine mm -hmm. people killed in the in these massacres across the Gaza Strip. So yes, far. my last question, uh, Samah, and of course our guests will be uh, joining, so stay with us when they do. Uh, do you believe Hamas has the key to cease fire? And do you think Israel will accept any mediation efforts to resolve the conflict, with Hamas still being part of the unity government in Palestine? Well, Israelis have been manipulating, you know, um, uh, when the national, uh, uh, um, you know, when uh, if we track it back to when Hamas came to office in 2000 and after the elections. They have refused Hamas to be part of the political uh, 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 game. Okay, When this national unity government took a place a few months ago, okay, Hamas was not in there really. Even if we talk about a national agreement between Fatah and Hamas, yes, there wasn't a national agreement, but there, there were none of uh, like the persons appointed by Hamas or some people who affiliated Hamas within the government. Yes. So practically Hamas left the office two months ago. But I think Israel has wanted any kind of war 
to cover the failure of the peace process with the Palestinian Authority. Simply, it's not about the national unity. It's a pretext that Israel is using in the international community to, look, to say to, to, to those people, look, guys, Hamas is a terrorist organization. It can be a part of this political game, and we have to attack them. This is what the Israelis want, simply, to cover the failure with the peace process that took place with Abbas. They've been negotiating for a long time, and the Americans were blaming the Israelis for not giving up on the settlements, confiscating lands in the West Bank, and they have blamed them publicly, really. So Israel had to go to war, and I think the reason for going to this war, as I said, is to cover the failure. Do, do you agree, Sabah? Yes. Stay with us, uh, Sam. Absolutely, I, don't know. I agree with that, and I think the Israelis are uh, really conscientious about what what's been happening in Gaza because you know we've seen what's happening in Shuja'iya in the area, and in the past couple of days, also there is a whole wholesale slaughter of uh, Palestinian uh, uh, Palestinian civilians in other part of Gaza as well. Israel tried to prevent journalists, uh, Western journalists, uh, from entering into such areas to discover what's been happening. And uh, according to some reports, the bodies are in the street of Gaza in some areas. And the atrocities that took place in Shuja'iya, for example, has been well documented as well. I think these reports will eventually see the, the, the light and people will be aware of the atrocities that have taken place in Palestine because Israel is failing actually to achieve its military and political object, uh, objective in, in Gaza. They are resorting to uh, mass killing of Palestinian innocent uh, civilians and also children. They wanted to cow the Palestinian people by killing, killing their children uh, and uh, committing such vile atrocities. Uh, the international uh, humanitarian organization will be able to condemn it, but will not be able to do much unless there is a mass uh, dissent in the West by the people, uh, by the people in the, uh, on the street demanding justice for the Palestinian people. We cannot go on for another 10 years and 15 years to see continuously such massacres is committed against the Palestinian mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And we have 100,000 or 50,000 demonstrations on the street. We need a massive campaign, actually, to uh, boycott Israel and to uh, uh, say to Israel in the 21st century there is no uh, time and place for a state, racist state like you, to exist. J Jim Brand, what is, in your opinion, the, the, the way out of the conflict at the diplomatic level, at least, or political level? Well, the danger with that is it presents uh, too much trust in the players. I mean, it, it's notable, for example, that Hammond, the British, the new British Foreign Secretary, mm -hmm. was sat next to Netanyahu today, and uh, in his interview immediately, he was expressing support for Israel and saying that you know Israel was justified in self-defense and so on. But when he came out and spoke to Sky News television in Britain, he said that there was uh, you know, real danger that uh, Israel would um, overstep the mark and the casualties were becoming too great and so on. And, 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 in, and in that, I think he's genuinely reflecting a fear, not that he's personally concerned, but simply because they do realize that more than any other issue in the world, really, in general, the, the, the issue of occupation belongs first of all, in the hands of the people who are faced with occupation. But in the case of Palestine, it's, it's that bit different mm -hmm. because it's clearly an international issue. And the Israelis, the report I was quoting earlier into the 2009 yes. assault made it very clear that Israel sees the danger of losing the propaganda war as being a very important element. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it puts places like London and that yes. world opinion um, far more on, uh, at center stage. Sam Habib, do you think there will be any avenues to conflict resolution in the near future? Well, uh, for the time being, I think it's going to take quite a while, really. You know, the Americans came to the region, Kerry made some sort of advancement within the uh, ceasefire talks, but I think it needs some more time. The Israelis need to, I think, if, if the Israelis would need to agree on a ceasefire, there got to be more pressure from the Palestinian resistance, and that's the case now. You know, Bengarian Airport is in hold again today as more uh, uh, airline companies have suspended their flights to Israel. Uh, the rockets have reached the airport again today. There's more uh, Israeli casualties, but as you know, Israelis would not really recognize the number, the uh, real number, but there's at least eight killed today. So the more we have a pressure within the front, 
on the uh, I mean on the national front within Israel, I think we would see a quick end to what is happening mm-hmm. on the Palestinian side. Uh, if you hear what's going on, the people there they don't care now. They say it's either we get the siege lifted and our suffering come to an end, or we die because we already die in a slow manner. The siege that is being imposed in Gaza for a very long time is sort of a slow death that is sentencing people to sort of suffering and, 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 and despair. So people now in Gaza, they have no choice. The choice that they have in front of them is just ending the siege of Gaza. And this is the reason that Hamas okay, uh, uh, demands are still solid and they didn't make any concession. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that Hamas would make sort of essential conditions. Hamas might make some sort of concessions on its demands, but not the main one. It could be about the technicalities of when and how and where to achieve these conditions. But I think Hamas is not going to make lots of concessions on this regard. Palestinian journalist Sami Habib joined us from London. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. Thanks a lot. I would like to thank our guests with me at the studio, Jim Brown of Stop the War Coalition and Sabah Jawad of Iraqis Against Co- uh, Occupation. And our other guests joined us over the phone, Tamara Barakat and Muhammad Ali and Palestinian journalist Sam Habib. Although Operation Protective Edge may in fact compel Hamas to enter more serious negotiations, analysts argue the group might see ground incursions as an opportunity to entangle the IDF in prolonged, indecisive fighting, which means a conflict in which Israeli military and Palestinian civilian casualties increase. Such a scenario could set the stage for a critical Israeli decision on whether to expand the operation. And while many believe that Israel will end its operation when its objectives are achieved, Others argue that as it has been from the beginning, the end to this latest round of fighting and the welfare of the people of Gaza is in the hands of Hamas. I'll be with you again soon on Straightforward. in Palestine. It's very effective, very unified. Many organizations work together. It was very effective. Uh, had a tremendous spirit. And I think the police said, well, we'll give them the whole street. I think they actually worked so out. So they the, cooperated. They worked hand in hand. The police, I can't really, I can't criticize the police with that. They gave us the full width of the street. Sometimes they say, well, you can have half the width of the street. They just said, have it. And I think it was probably in their interest. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, the question of BBC bias. So I uh, went to look online at the reports of the demonstration on Sunday, and there were some very good ones. There was one, there's a newspaper that's not particularly sympathetic. Their website's the Daily Mail. The website, the Daily Mail online website, had a headline, uh, in our thousands, in our millions, we are all Palestinians, which is a slogan that people were chanting. So on that the was on the Daily Mail? That was on the Daily Mail website Quite on Sunday. Eyebrow raising, isn't and it? And they had a very good, very uh, respectful picture of the full width of the demonstration. So I then went to look at the BBC's coverage on BBC online. Mm-hmm. And I, must, I, was, I was disgusted. I'm, I'm used to things and I was just disgusted because they had, I think, about eight items relating to Palestine, and the main one to do with protest was riots in Paris. Not in and, London, even. And there was no mention. And when you read to the end of the French article, you saw a reference to the London demonstration. And then they had links on the BBC website to, for example, the Times of India reporting on the London demonstration. <laughs> But no BBC report on the London yeah. demonstration. Yeah. Quite extraordinary. Can I just say that the BBC is well known for its uh, bad coverages and biased coverages against the Palestinians and the Arab, uh, Arab causes. They've done the same to Lebanon, uh, resistance against the Israeli invasion of Lebanon and the resistance against the Israelis in, in other parts of the world mm-hmm. and their coverage of Syria as well. The BBC reflect uh, the views of the government. Uh, of the British government and the British government views about... Excuse is some... Um, well, the, the, the rocket, the, the so-called rockets, which somebody has called more like fireworks coming from Gaza, uh, the tunnels, uh, these are the two big excuses. But they're not the reason. The reason is, is the, 
the uh, injustice of the occupation, of the suppression of the national rights of the Palestinians. That's the, mm -hmm. that's the fundamental issue. And you can always find some justification or some excuse in the same way as uh, in, in ordinary life. Like you can pick up on what somebody is looking at you wrongly or spilt something on you and then use that as an excuse. It's mm -hmm. just an excuse. Mm -hmm. Sabah Jawad, speaking of the tunnels, from a security perspective, Jonathan Rosen questions what could have happened had Hamas used its tunnels into Israel before Operation Protect Protective Edge. Well, I mean, it seems, seems the tunnel that took Israel by surprise, uh, at least uh, what the Israelis are saying, the press uh, and Israel are saying, is that the, the Netanyahu government uh, stood by not doing anything or did not know, uh, you know, the development of this uh, sinister uh, tunnels and, and the occupied territories and particularly in Gaza. But everybody knows that the Palestinians be relying on these tunnels actually to break the sanction, mm -hmm. to break the uh, blockade uh, against, uh, uh, against uh, Gaza. It's been uh, in place uh, uh, since 2008. Jim, um, here in the UK we've seen protests starting in Glasgow in relation to what was considered nuanced media coverage. What do you think of the media starting here in the UK? Oh, I mean, we had this uh, very effective demonstration last Saturday, for example. Tell us more about that. Um, well, we say up to 100,000. I, I don't know how many it was, but it was a magnificent thing. It was seen in Palestine. There was a report on Channel 4 which said that it was received in Palestine with joyous disbelief. Mm -hmm. That was the effect. <laughs> Hello, welcome back to Straightforward, Levant TV's Middle East political debate show with me, Khal al Khwairi. The carnage in Gaza is ongoing. Some are celebrating it and calls for genocide have been have initiated. What did the world do and what did the Arab world do and who are the key regional and international players in preparation for the attack and throughout it? Swedish authorities refused to allow the plane of Israeli President Shimon Peres to cross into its airspace. And throughout the show, we will look at the humanitarian aspect of the crisis and then assess political dynamics and policy implications. Let me first welcome our guests here at the studio, Jim Brown of Stop the War Coalition and Sabah Jawad of Iraqi Democrats Against Occupation. Welcome on the show. Before we delve into our discussion today, let's have a look at this brief report by uh, Saima Jafar and Hassan Samak. As Israel intensified its operations in Gaza, hundreds of thousands of people around the world protested in support for the people of Gaza. Thousands took to the streets in London, New York, Paris, and even in Tel Aviv. London, Manchester, Liverpool, and Newcastle saw marches to protest at the BBC's biased reporting, as well as to gather signatures for an open letter to the BBC Director General. London took to the main stage of the protest movement. I urge all sides. United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki moon has urged Israel and the Palestinians to stop fighting and made an urgent appeal for maximum restraint. Meanwhile, US President Barack Obama said although there is great concern for the increasing Palestinian civilian death toll, the US supported Israel's mission. As I've said many times, Israel has a right to defend itself against rocket and tunnel attacks from Hamas. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, who is in Israel to conduct peace negotiations despite a Federal Aviation Administration ban on flying to the region, said slow progress was made on ceasefire talks. But will reactions and diplomacy help end what is happening on the ground? Jim Brand, since 2008, Israel had not had any ground invasion in Gaza. Before we get into the global reactions to this, how could we look at the significance of the timing and could we relate this to the recent event of forming a unity government with Hamas? I think undoubtedly, um, if you take the issue of the kidnapping of the three settler youth mm -hmm. and then the killing of the, um, the, the Palestinian boy, uh, for the Israeli government simply declared that the kidnapping was the work of Hamas. Even though, on the face of it, you would think, why on earth would Hamas specifically do that? It would be nonsense. Uh, so, the intention of the Israeli government to 
uh, finger Hamas, to, to, to blame Hamas for things, is very, very clear. And I don't think there is any doubt that it has to do with the unity of the, mm -hmm. of the different factions in, in Palestine as Why a whole. Why do you call them settler youth, not Israeli citizens? Well, the world, mm -hmm. the world recognizes a distinction. I mean, you have to be, you know, you have to be um, uh, cynical because there are protecting powers. Nevertheless, the world does not recognize uh, them as being Israeli citizens in that, in the same sense. Mm -hmm. Sabah Shawad, do you agree? Well, I think the distinction between uh, Israeli citizens and uh, and uh, settlers is very uh, uh, weak uh, distinctions. Um, Israeli society is based, based on uh, settling in, the, in a land that does not belong to them. And therefore, the settlers, uh, and I think it's a, it's a fair description of them, uh, occupy the lands of Palestinians and uh, promote uh, uh, discrimination against the Palestinians. And the Palestinians in, uh, have the right to resist mm -hmm. the, these people and to expel them from their land as, uh, as long as they are basically uh, tools and the occupiers mm -hmm. and, and uh, Sabah Shawad, Hamas fired four rockets on Israel. These were met by six Israeli airstrikes. From a power perspective, what can you tell us about the disproportionate aspect throughout this? It's always been the case of disproportions uh, regarding the Palestinian struggle uh, to return to their homeland and the Israeli occupation uh, uh, of Palestine. Uh, the Israelis get all the uh, aid and uh, support from the most powerful nations on earth, the Western nations, uh, topped by the United States. Uh, they get the most advanced military uh, hardware, like Phantom F-16, uh, mm -hmm. tanks, and so on. And they got all the protection that's needed, actually. And the Palestinians have nothing, mm -hmm. uh, basically. They rely on some kind of uh, rockets which they manufacture themselves, or they got given by Syria yes. and uh, some other uh, regimes in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So it's always the disproportion. And, uh, and the Israelis always claim, actually, that their action is a response to these rocket attacks. Mm -hmm. But even if Palestinians don't fire rockets at, uh, at Israel, the, uh, the Israelis will find excuses to try to suppress the will of the Palestinian people. They've been at it for 65 years, mm -hmm. and they will continue so until they break the back of the Palestinian resistance. Mm -hmm. Jim Brand, the Jerusalem Post, argues that no military operation could be more justified than Operation Protective Edge. What do you think of that? Well, I think, first of all, as in all of human life, you have to distinguish between reasons and excuses. And to summarize it as briefly as possible, this is an, uh, an excuse. This is not a reason. This assault on Gaza, uh, the, ex 